Hi, and welcome to week six of English Linguistics 315. We are continuing today with the module on child language acquisition. And so the last concept that we talked about uh, in last week's lecture on child language acquisition was universal grammar. And we were talking about universal grammar with respect to the question, uh, the fundamental question that we've been interested in throughout the semester, uh, how does a child actually figure out uh, the first language? And so one of the answers that we uh, sort of discussed towards the end uh, of the first lecture uh, was universal grammar. And the exciting thing about universal grammar is that you can actually test uh, about the limits of the kinds of mistakes that uh, children can actually make, as well as the limits to the kinds of rules that languages can have. So we looked into the limits that children's mistakes can actually make. We saw examples from the Morphe modern constraint, and I said that we will talk a lot more about Morphe modern constraint uh, next week when we get into morphology. Uh, but we looked at two examples uh, from uh, limits to kids' mistakes, and this is the last uh, thing that we actually talked about, that uh, children do not make certain kinds of linguistic errors that we actually expect them to make. And the second uh, kind of uh, evidence for universal grammar is what we are going to talk about in today's uh, video. And this has to do with the uh, predictions about universal grammar with respect to the limits uh, to language variation. And so this is an exciting prediction because if we are indeed born with a universal grammar uh, template uh, for learning a language, uh, then we should see similarities across languages. So, for example, when we talk about rules, we looked at rules of phonology, rules of phonetics in the last two modules, uh, but there are also rules for morphology and syntax and semantics, which we will be talking about uh, later on the semester. And there are some rules that no languages will have. And if you look at data from across languages, you can actually see that uh, even though human languages can vary because there are 7,000 human languages, there are some similarities or there are some uh, rules that you will never find in any of these human languages. And so here is the first example to limits to language variation. Here are some things that no language does. So let's look at the English example, Dave is a nice guy. So how would you make this sentence into a question? The way that English does this is it changes the word order. So instead of saying Dave is a nice guy, you can invert the verb is and the subject Dave and get is Dave a nice guy? And suddenly now this entire sentence is a question. Uh, and you can see that this is a very systematic way of doing it, right, in English. But no language, and, and, and if you look at different languages, you can actually see that other languages can also do things very similar to English. But what no language does is you cannot just reverse the word order of the sentence. So you cannot just go from Dave is a nice guy to guy nice A is Dave, like just keeping on reversing uh, each word uh, and making that into a question. That's something that's not possible. That's ungrammatical. Neither can you switch the first word and the last word of a sentence, Dave is a nice guy, guy is a nice Dave, to uh, make a question. So this suggests that there are systematic ways in which you can actually ask a question from a declarative statement uh, and no language just randomly uh, changes the word order or randomly changes the first word and the second or, or the last word and forms a question. The second one has to do with uh, things that are common to all human languages and these include things like lexical categories also called as parts of speech, uh, something we will talk a lot more about when we get into morphology, when we get into syntax. Uh, and so the parts of speech that English has are nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, uh, etc. And these are supposed to be a linguistic universal. They're supposed to exist throughout languages. Uh, and so uh, I have a note here that many languages may actually lack adjectives, but we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but it's a controversial topic. Uh, and there are also other features such as morphe modern constraint that we saw with respect to example one, uh, with evidence to universal grammar, when children um, 
it could say uh, mouse eater or mice eater, but they never say cookies eater. They only say cookie eater. And word order universals. Uh, so what are word order universals? So as you can see in sentences like Dave likes John, uh, you can divide the words into what is prominent in the sentence. For example, the subject is prominent in English sentences. That's why you say Dave first, right? So that's a subject. And then you have the verb uh, that's very often um, in the present tense or a past tense, right? With, with some kind of time information. So likes is the verb uh, in the sentence. And then the object of the liking. Uh, who does Dave like? John uh, is who Dave likes. So you can see that um, with respect to the way the subject, verb, and object is ordered in English, you can actually write rules based on this. So you can write the rule subjects, uh, S precedes object, O. The object is next to the verb, we, and the object is not first in the sentence. Now, if you look at different word orders for the 7,000 languages in the world, you can see that the two most common word orders that you see in the majority of languages in the world are SVO, subject, verb, and object, and subject, object, and verb. So English, the word order of English is SVO, subject, verb, and object. And there are other languages, such as Japanese, uh, that have the subject, object, and uh, verb pattern. And if you see if you go back uh, to the slide and see, uh, both SOV and SVO um, satisfy all these rules. Subject precedes object. That's true, right? Subject is the first thing in the um, uh, in the word order. Object is next to the verb. That's true. And object is not first in the sentence. Now, the second most uh, common word order is VSO, which satisfies two rules, uh, including number one, that subject um, precedes the object. But the, the one that it doesn't satisfy is that the object is not next to the verb. The third most common is VOS. It satisfies two rules, but not number one, that subject should come first. Fourth most common is OVS. It satisfies only one rule, that is the object is next to the verb. Subjects do not precede objects and object is not first in the sentence. And then the fifth most common is OSV, which satisfies no rules uh, of, of any of these three rules. And essentially, this is a not attested uh, word order. So, uh, so just to wrap up that, so we have seen uh, four pieces of evidence for universal grammar, uh, one from the limits of that, uh, to the mistakes that children actually make, and second, uh, with respect to the limits of language uh, variation. So now we are getting into uh, the status of language acquisition uh, because this is what we are really interested in in this unit. We are interested in how do children learn language and so we suggested that maybe it's through universal grammar but uh, we also suggested that um, learning a language is like learning uh, any other human uh, instinct or instinctive behavior. And so if this is true, then there are certain developmental milestones that children should actually achieve as they grow uh, up and learn um, language. So it's more like maturation than purely learning uh, because of a social need. We also said that you start learning a language when you are in your mother's womb. So your language learning has far preceded your time uh, on earth uh, after you're born. Uh, you start learning when you are in your womb and there's some experimental evidence from the 1917 suggesting that. And this has to do with uh, infants who have been given pacifiers to suck on and they uh, are played recordings of their first language, that is English uh, or French uh, for French babies. Uh, and these are babies that are as young as four days old, right? And what they found was that French babies liked French more than English and English babies liked English more than uh, French. The reason is because in your mother's womb, if you're an English baby, you've been listening to English uh, speech sounds. And that's a very familiar, uh, comforting sound to you uh, after you're born. Versus if you're a French baby, you've probably been listening to French sounds uh, and therefore French is more comforting than English to you. And what they uh, did was a follow-up study where they took out the speech sounds specifically and they only kept intonation. And what they found was that uh, French babies continued to like French more than English 
with just intonation and no speed sounds and English babies liked English more than French with just uh, intonation but when intonation was also uh, taken out by, when it was just speed sounds without intonation uh, then this preference for English or French actually disappeared. So what we can learn is that um, when you're in your womb, when you're in your mother's womb, uh, what you are tapping into is intonation, just an intonational patterns uh, of your primary uh, and secondary caregiver. And that's all that you can hear, right? You can't really hear any of the specific speech sounds. It's really difficult for you to tap into that when you're in your mother's womb, but you can definitely tap into ah, 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 kind of patterns, right? Which is your intonation. Uh, patterns, which is different for different languages. So English has a different intonation pattern, French has a different intonation pattern, and so on. When babies start to talk, we call this as babbling. Uh, and this starts as early as uh, three months uh, of age. And the fact is that it's not a uh, uniform behavior across the board for babies, but the different stages and um, each uh, kid actually goes through these different stages roughly the same time. The first stage of babbling is called as cooing and this roughly starts around four to six months and these are very basic uh, single uh, phones that the baby is actually making. So very often these are things like oogu, goo, goo, ju, ju uh, kind of sounds. They are velar or palatal sounds. The stage two uh, starts immediately after the cooing stage and this is the canonical bubbling stage which is about seven to ten months and these are chains of identical patterns so uh, the baby is most likely uh, going to make things like ba 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 do 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 etc and this stage is also called as reduplicated bubbling or syllable bubbling and the last stage which uh, lasts just before the the baby's first birthday is called as variegated uh, bubbling and this has to do when the baby actually uh, syllabifies uh, and chains different syllables together like buga bimo mani mafa popa sam etc and this stage is also called as jargon bubbling or gibberish bubbling because very often it sounds like the baby speaking an alien tongue now why uh, are we interested in these stages of bubbling and why do children hit these stages at roughly the same uh, kind of age. The key idea, again, going back to experimental evidence from the 1960s and 1970s, has to do with the fact that uh, there are different stages and children hit these stages uh, universally. So there are some um, um, babies that um, have had to have throats put into their uh, mouth as soon as they're born uh, and because of these throats uh, for various medical reasons uh, have prevented them from babbling at say four months or six months etc and what happens is once uh, the medical condition is over and once these tubes are actually removed from these children they start to babble not at the cooing stage if they are say at seven months or eight months but they catch up to their stage uh, pretty quickly suggesting that this is some kind of a maturational schedule which is inborn in you uh, and that lets you catch up even though you might have missed a couple of months uh, of babbling. So here are the stages of learning phonemes uh, and the first ones that are learned are labials right so b, b, m are the first sounds that are learned. Alveolars, d, d, n, s, z, uh, are learned next. Velars, k, g, and n, and then the alveopalatals, and then the last sounds that are learned are dentals. And dentals are quite hard uh, for the baby to actually say. So, why do babies actually learn phonemes in this particular order? Very often it's easy for you to think that maybe it's from the front of the mouth to the back of the mouth or about how common the sounds are, but actually dentals are really common uh, sounds in English. The reason is because this order actually matches how rare the sounds are uh, universally across 7,000 languages of the world. So labials are actually very, very common across languages and dental or dental fricatives are actually rather rare. So 
languages that actually have s and z, which are dental fricatives, are actually rather rare. And so this is the reason why children actually start learning labials and then move on to the more difficult or the more rarer sounds in the world's languages. So the conclusion that we can draw with respect to the stages of learning the phonemes is that the time it takes to learn to pronounce a particular speech sound is correlated with how common that speech sound is in the world's languages. So the more common the, the sound is in the world, the more confident the child is in that uh, their language has that sound. And as you can uh, uh, perceive and as you can uh, believe that children as young as six months or eight months can actually produce all the sounds in the world and then as they grow older and as they keep hearing different sounds from their caregivers um, a language they start to uh, lose the, the speech sounds that they actually don't need for their language or languages. Now, how do children actually learn phonemes? How do they know the distinction between what's a phoneme and what's an allophone? So uh, remember from our phonology unit that we saw that two different speech sounds can be allophones in one language and phonemes in another language. So the example that we looked at was with respect to t and the aspirated version t in English and Thai. And we said that in English, there are allophones of the same phoneme, but in uh, Thai, these are different uh, phonemes. So how do kids actually learn that uh, these two speech sounds are allophones uh, of one phoneme or allophones of different phonemes? One way in which uh, people have answered this question is that maybe the children are actually born uh, unable to hear any distinctions. And then when learning words, kids actually learn that they must distinguish some sounds from other sounds, like phonemes from allophones. And so Thai kids learn to hear the difference between t and t, and English kids don't. Well, in fact, that's actually not true. The way that children actually learn phonemes is exactly the opposite way of this. Children can hear the distinction between all the speed sounds like I just mentioned. And what they do is they start to learn to ignore some of the differences in case that their language is actually uh, doesn't exhibit that particular difference. So again, this has to do with experimental evidence that we saw from the 1960s and the 1970s that when uh, children are asked uh, to uh, suckle with like a pacifier in their mouth and they listen to speech sounds from their uh, language, uh, when they hear the same sound over and over again in English, for example, they get bored. And when they hear a different speech sound that they haven't heard before, they get really excited and they start sucking uh, the pacifier more. Now, what they did was they used the pacifier to measure the rate of sucking, right? So it's a special pacifier that they used. And they were made to hear the same allophone t. And when the, 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 the children were bored, they uh, would change, the experimenters would change the speech sound from uh, the uh, alveolar uh, voiceless plosive to the aspirated version t. And what they found was that below six months, uh, the children would suckle faster with the change from t to t, uh, but above six months, they actually don't react when uh, t is changed to t. So children as young as six months can actually distinguish between all the speech sounds uh, and hear the difference between the speech sounds. But once you reach six months and above, you actually fail to uh, perceive the differences between uh, t and t because English does not have these two as two different phonemes. English has them as allophones of the same uh, phoneme. So the conclusion that we can draw from this is that kids can learn to ignore distinctions between speech sounds if it is actually not relevant to the language that they are actually learning, in this case, English. Uh, one final question before we conclude this lecture. How do English kids actually learn to stop distinguishing uh, the alveolar uh, version from the aspirated version? Um, well, what they do is they must be figuring out the rules for uh, t and t. And the rule is that, well, the aspirated version appears in the onset of a syllable and the other version, the non-aspirated version, appears in the elsewhere 
uh, condition. And so what they must actually be doing is they must be dividing up words into syllables. They probably also know what's an onset, what's a coda, and what's a nucleus. And so what this actually means is that children as young as six months have already mastered the syllabification algorithm that we looked at uh, in the last uh, phonology unit. So in some sense, phonology rules and syllabification is innate in uh, children as young as six months. So the main point that we talked about with respect to how kids actually learn rules is that, well, they first apply a broad rule and then they restrict the rule as they get more information, more data set, and they become older. However, one puzzle remains, and I don't actually have a very good answer to this, uh, and this is uh, research, that is an open-ended question. How do kids actually learn not to apply a particular rule? That is, how do they learn that goad is not a form of English? Uh, because, well, you're not saying things like goad, so there's no way that the child can actually hear this in the child's environment and it's also not uh, a case that children can actually distinguish between what's wrong and what's just rare because they can actually just maybe think that gold is a very rare form uh, as a past tense. Uh, so we don't actually know uh, what actually children do when they are learning not to apply a rule if you're interested. This is a very good research question uh, and an open-ended one. All right, just to summarize, uh, this week's uh, module, uh, Child Language Acquisition, kids actually don't just imitate the speech that they hear. What they actually do is they create hypotheses, they make predictions, and then they adjust the rules uh, of phonology, of syntax, of morphology, etc., to learn their first language. This task is really difficult because, as you and I know, the rules of English or any language are extremely complex. We don't explicitly correct children and children's mistakes. We don't speak English softly or uh, slowly. We actually don't give them any word boundaries in fluent speech, and that learning must be complete in four to six years. The key hypothesis for this was universal grammar. So knowing uh, our first language is basically knowing how the rules of universal grammar look. And so children begin learning language in the womb. Uh, there are many parts of language acquisition that follow a set of universal stages. This is called as babbling. Uh, and children learn uh, the phonemes uh, by uh, forgetting what they actually don't need in their first language. And they adopt a bold strategy in learning rules. So this is where we end um, child language acquisition and we will now be moving on to the last section of child language acquisition.